Good morning. My name is Colleen Chogan, and I'm the Deputy Director of our Outreach Unit here at the Library of Congress, and it's my privilege to welcome you to the 18th Annual National Book Festival. As you may know, the Library of Congress is the largest library in the world. We have millions of books, manuscripts, photographs, newspapers, maps, comics, and other items in our collection. We're thrilled that you're here today with us, but we also invite you to come visit us on Capitol Hill or online at loc.gov. Today we welcome author James Swanson to the teen stage. He is the award-winning author of the best-selling page-turner, Manhunt, The 12-Day Chase for Lincoln's Killer. He also wrote a YA ad adaptation for Manhunt, along with a young adult nonfiction book on the Kennedy assassination. His most recent book, the book we're going to hear about today, is Chasing King's Killer, which is about the murder of Martin Luther King Jr. I just finished James's book a few weeks ago. It's a terrifically detailed account of the unfortunate circumstances leading to the King assassination. There's a lot of true crime detail in the book, including sketches, diagrams, photographs, and maps, which help the reader understand what happened on that fateful day in 1968. We learn a great deal about Martin Luther King Jr., his role as a leader of the civil rights movement. Chasing King's Killer also provides fascinating details about how the assassin, James Earl Ray, used disguises and other tricks to elude the police and the FBI after the murder. This is a real page turner. I started reading the book one night before going to bed, and I finished it the next day. And that's the sign of a very, very good book. Please join me in welcoming to the teen stage one of the best historical crime writers in the United States today, James Swanson. Thank you, Colleen. It's great to be back at the National Book Festival. This is my fifth time here, and I love coming here to meet all of you and, and meet the readers. So why did I write this book? Uh, this is the final book in my trilogy on American assassinations about Abraham Lincoln, John F. Kennedy, and Martin Luther King. And I focused on these three great American heroes. It's not that I'm obsessed with death and violence. Uh, but rather key moments of change in American history when something happens and everything changes overnight and nothing is ever the same again. This book is also set in the turbulent 1960s America. For those who remember, or those who don't, those were the years of the Vietnam War, the race to the moon, civil unrest, riots in the streets, and assassinations, not just of Dr. King, but of Malcolm X, President Kennedy, Robert Kennedy. It was a tumultuous, confusing time. The book covers Martin Luther King's entire life, from childhood to his adulthood, but it especially focuses on his last years. So this is not just a book about death. It's about a great life and a heroic life, too. For me, this is probably the most personal of these three books of this trilogy. I remember the night that Martin Luther King was killed. In the riots that followed, my father drove me through parts of our hometown, Chicago, that had burned to the ground. Until recently, parts of our city had never recovered in the last 50 years since the death of Dr. King. I remember going to our local post office and seeing reward posters for the assassin pinned to the bulletin board, posters which I now have in my collection and which I share with you in the book. So this book, probably more than the other two, is my way of bringing the past that I lived through as a boy to a new generation. And the reason I write books for children and for teens is that I don't think you have to be spectators or observers of history. You can actually be part of it. Uh, young people were a very important part of the civil rights movement, uh, just as they're involved in it today. So where does the book begin? It begins in 1958, 10 years before King's assassination. And it begins with a stabbing, a little known episode in King's life. King was just becoming famous for his leadership of the 1955 Montgomery bus boycott. And he was in New York City to promote his first book, Stride Toward Freedom. 
And it was going so well. He was at a department store in Harlem. He was sitting at a desk and he was signing books. And then a well-dressed middle-aged black woman approached him. She fit right in with the crowd, nothing looked odd. And she said, are you Martin Luther King? And he looked up and said, well, yes, I am. And with that, she drew a letter opener, but it was razor sharp, like a miniature samurai sword. She pulled it out of her bag, she raised it up high in the air and plunged it into his chest. And she stabbed him so hard that the handle broke off and the blade stayed embedded in his chest. It looked like it was right where his heart was. Immediately, there was panic and chaos. Someone reached for the blade to pull it out, and, but then someone shouted, don't do that, you'll kill him if you pull it out. It was true. As doctors would find out later, the blade was so close to King's aorta that any movement, even coughing or sneeze, could have led to his instant death. But he didn't die. King woke up hours later in a Harlem hospital. He had survived. He would live. So why do I begin the book here, 10 years before the main story of the book? I begin here because King's life could have been over before it ever really began. If he had been killed in that stabbing, we might not even remember the name of Martin Luther King. The woman's name was Azola Curry, and she was deemed later to be mentally ill. She was charged with attempted murder, but she spent the rest of her life in mental institutions. And she's one of the last survivors of this whole tale. She died just three years ago in her late 90s in 2015. But by then, she had really forgotten what she had done and how she almost changed history forever. Upon Martin Luther King's release from the hospital, he asked that there no be, be no vengeance against her and that she not be punished, but that she get support and understanding for the treatment she needed. But if she had succeeded, how would our world be different? We might ask, what would the world and what would America be like without that crucial decade of Martin Luther King's leadership? What great words would have gone unspoken? What great deeds would have gone undone? Martin Luther King had just narrowly escaped death. And from that moment on, he thought he was living on borrowed time. So what about King's life in these 10 years, in this short decade from 1958 to 68? It was a year filled, a decade filled with excitement, turmoil, great success, great setbacks. In 1963, Martin Luther King led the famous March on Washington that climaxed at the Lincoln Memorial, where he spoke to a crowd of 250,000 people and said, I have a dream. In 1964, he received the Nobel Peace Prize and worked hard for civil rights legislation that would pass soon, uh, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act. In 1965, he led the famous march from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama. Those were years of challenge and change for Dr. King and all Americans. In 1967, he took a major stand against the Vietnam War. But by the late 1960s, King's leadership of the civil rights movement was increasingly challenged by younger, more radical leaders. King faced a number of failures and setbacks, and these discouraged him. King experienced great self-doubt, and he began to wonder, was he the right man to continue to lead this movement? Was he the right man for the job? Then, on April 3rd, 1968, King was in Memphis, Tennessee, to support the city sanitation workers who were striking for better working conditions. King was exhausted from extensive travel. He was faced with a mounting burden of inner doubt about his own abilities as a leader. He was sick with a sore throat and a fever. And that night there was a massive storm with pouring rain and thunder. And the last thing he wanted to do was go outside and go and give a speech. But he did. At 8.30 p.m., King appeared at the Mason Temple and spoke to an overflowing crowd of 3,000 people. And in this speech, arguably the best of his life, he summarized his life and highlighted something that had happened to him 10 years before. He told the audience 
how he'd been stabbed by Isola Curry a decade before. He revealed that as he recovered from that attack, he had received a letter from a young white girl, a ninth grade student, who had read about what had happened to him. And in her letter, King said she wrote, I read that if you'd sneezed, you would have died. And I'm simply writing you to say that I'm so happy you didn't sneeze. King repeated her words, and he said, I'm so glad I didn't sneeze. <laughs> he said, if I had sneezed, I couldn't have been there at Selma. I couldn't have been the march in Washington. I couldn't be here tonight. He appreciated how he lived in the last decade and the years of progress, though not perfect, that had been made. King ended the speech by saying what I think are his finest public remarks, even greater than the march on Washington. So he said, like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain, and I've looked over, and I have seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And I'm so happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Then he collapsed into the arms of his best friend, Ralph Abernathy. Later, Abernathy said, I've never seen him better. But he should have feared one man. A few miles away, a man waited at a seedy hotel with a rifle. The next day, Martin Luther King would be dead, assassinated by perhaps the most unlikely killer, an escaped convict and petty criminal named James Earl Ray. So who was this Ray? He had grown up dirt poor in Missouri in a family of career criminals. Strangely, he was just the kind of underprivileged, uneducated child that Martin Luther King would have wanted to help. By Ray's teenage years, he was living the life of a failed criminal. He was in and out of jail until in 1959 he was sentenced to a 20-year term for robbery. And if he had served that entire sentence, we, we never would have heard of James Earl Ray. Except in 1967, he escaped. So why did he want to kill Martin Luther King? James Earl Ray did not escape from prison with a plan to assassinate Dr. King. No, he escaped to reinvent himself and forge a new life. He traveled to Canada, Mexico, and California. He took professional bartending lessons, dance classes, and locksmithing courses. The one thing he did not do is stalk Dr. King. For exactly one year, from March 1967 to March 1968, Ray enjoyed his new life. There's no evidence he even thought about Dr. King. That all changed when King flew to Los Angeles and gave a speech near Disneyland on March 16, 1968. The next day, on March 17th, King flew home. But on that same day, James Earl Ray packed up all his belongings, got in his Mustang sports car, and drove all the way across the country from California, ultimately to Memphis, Tennessee. And on the way, he bought a rifle. Something in Ray had changed. Like a caged homing pigeon or hibernating animal, Ray responded to an inner call that only he could hear. It would direct his movements for the next three weeks. It was though a silent alarm had rung inside him, summoning him south. By April 3rd, 1968, Ray was in Memphis, where Dr. King was. That night, King spoke at the Mason Temple and gave that great speech. The next morning, Ray found a rooming house with a direct view of the Lorraine Hotel, where King was staying. But Ray's room didn't have a clear view of the Lorraine. The windows were in the wrong place. It would have been impossible to attack Dr. King. So Ray went to a common bathroom down the hall. He punched out the window screen, but the window itself was stuck. There were just a few inches at the bottom that were still open, just enough space to poke out 
the barrel of a rifle. But even then, the view wasn't completely clear. So Ray had to stand in the bathtub to get an unobstructed view of King's room. When Dr. King finally emerged from his hotel room around six o'clock for dinner, General Ray was watching and waiting. As King stood on the balcony outside his room and looked down at his friends in the parking lot and spoke to them about going to dinner, James LeRae got him in the sights of his telescope and fired one shot. The bullet hit Dr. King in the right cheek, entered his neck, severed arteries, crashed through his spine. People watching yelled, Dr. King has been shot. He was immediately rushed to the hospital, but an EKG show he had no heart function. Doctors tried valiantly to resuscitate him for almost an hour, but at 7.05 p.m., only one hour after he was shot, he was pronounced dead. Martin Luther King Jr., the great civil rights leader, was gone. So what about his assassin? Unbelievably, after the murder, James Earl Ray escaped and disappeared. Speeding away in his Mustang, he fled the murder scene without a moment to spare. One minute after he escaped, the police showed up at the door where he escaped and they would have captured him on the spot, but he escaped just in the nick of time. His escape launched the biggest manhunt in the history of the FBI. 3,000 agents, half the entire FBI, were put on the chase to find the killer to identify who he was. No one knew the man named Jones or Ray had killed Dr. King. They only knew that an unknown man. It took weeks. Ray eventually made his way to Canada, then to England and Portugal, and finally back to England when he couldn't arrange passage to Africa, where he hoped to become a paid mercenary in, in one of the white ruled governments. In fact, it was only a slip of fate that his passport was double checked at Heathrow Airport in London on June 8, 1968 leading to his eventual arrest. It took 106 days from King's assassination to raise extradition from England to the United States. And in fact, it was only 15 months since Ray had escaped from prison. One of history's most shocking possibilities is that if James LeRae had escaped to Africa, he probably would have disappeared for good and the murder of Dr. King would have escaped justice forever. But he was caught. Ray spent the rest of his life in prison. He survived Martin Luther King by 30 years, dying in 1998. So what should we take away from the story? For those of us who remember it, it's hard to believe that it's been 50 years, 1968 to 2018, that Dr. King was killed. If he was alive today, and that's not inconceivable, he would be 89 years old. He was only 39 when he died, such a young man. But he might still be alive, leading the charge for equal rights and fair treatment. How we could have benefited from five decades of his continued leadership. Imagine if he was here all that time. What would Dr. King say to us today? I think he might ask us to turn to something he said in 1965 when he stood on the steps of the state capitol in Montgomery, Alabama after the successful march from Selma to Montgomery. Standing there, he asked a question that still reverberates today. Dr. King said, how long will it take? He said, how long will prejudice blind the visions of men darken their understanding and drive bright-eyed wisdom from her sacred throne? How long will justice be crucified and truth bear it? And you know what he said? Dr. King said, how long? Not long, because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And he repeated that phrase over and over again, how long will it take? How long will it take? And then he gave the answer. Certainly, much progress has been made. Dr. King would say that today. But he would also say even more needs to be done. So I ask you today, and I think that Dr. King would say to us now, how long will it take? 
And for that, I thank you, and I'd love to take questions. Uh, so please ask. Thanks. Hi, Mr. No, okay, not yet. Oh. Okay. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, did you ever get any like, uh, like blowback from like publishers or even parents for writing about assassinations for young adult and middle grade readers? I really enjoyed your books, by the way. So, uh, strangely, not really. Uh, I, I talked to a lot of young readers, uh, including my two boys. Uh, when I wrote my first assassination book on Lincoln, they were seven and nine, and one boy said, readers want blood. And the other boy said, and knives. <laughs> also, here's why I don't get blowback from parents. And I, I discuss it with parents, with kids and adults. I also uh, asked my friend Congressman John Lewis about this, who wrote a wonderful forward to the book. And I said, you know, I don't want to look like I'm exploiting the death of Dr. King. He said, no, tell the story like it was. Tell it like it happened. It's a real story. It's, it's not fiction. Martin Luther King was killed in a horrible way by a racist man. A wife lost her husband. Children lost their father. So part of the violence in my books is real. I don't want kids to think it, it's fun or it's not real or that violence doesn't have consequences. And I also set it in the context of history and what really happened. And so uh, that's why young people and parents and teachers and librarians have told me uh, they appreciate the vivid realism of my books, but they don't find it salacious or exploitive for its own purpose. So uh, people have been very accepting of the way I, I write the books. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Um, I just wanted to thank you quickly for writing the books. I remember in seventh grade we were assigned to read it, and it was really a breakthrough for me because it's what got me really interested in American history. Um, I was just uh, wondering about Chasing Lincoln's Killer. Was it difficult to uh, sort of adapt Manhunt into something for it young was, adults? It was. It was. In my ignorance, I thought, oh, this will be so easy. I'll just edit down the adult book into a little young adult book. Uh, Manhunt was about 140,000 words long, uh, and Chasing uh, Lincoln's Killer, well, I think, was about 30, 32,000 words long. I, I was quickly disabused of how easy it would be, and it felt like I had to really write a new book. Uh, I just couldn't edit it down. I really needed to write it for teens. So I, I wrote it really for my boys, or the boy I was. I think one reason I enjoy writing books for teens is, in many ways, I'm, I'm still the kid I always was. Uh, that has advantages and disadvantages. Uh, but I imagine how I would want to read the story. And the, the main difference between writing for teens and adults is you cannot dumb it down. They always know. I knew when I was a kid, and, and you kids in the audience now know it when adults are speaking down to you or when they're concealing something from you. The main thing is you have to take out some of the tertiary characters. You have to take out maybe some of the irony or some of the incongruities or the foreshadowing. Uh, so I really had to rewrite the book entirely for a younger audience. Uh, it's not easy to do. Uh, and I, I, I've done other young adult books based on adult books, and I, I learned my lesson the first time, that you really have to write a new book that speaks to a, a teen audience. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Um, I was going to ask you, how do you get into the point of view of the assassin who's, like, so evil? How do I get into the point of view of the assassin? Well, in the case of Lincoln, and certainly in the case of James or Ray, all my books, the heroes are these great heroes of American life, Abraham Lincoln, John Kennedy, and Martin Luther King. And by the end of the book, I want it to be absolutely clear that those people and what they stood for are the heroes and the guiding principles of the book. But in the case of John Wilkes Booth, I want you to know what it's like to be in the saddle, galloping away on an escape, to know what it's like to be a wounded, hunted man, to know what it's like to think, you think you're gonna be a great hero to the South, but then read the newspapers that say, you're a devil, you've done evil. And in the case of uh, James Laura Ray, uh, he was a cipher, he was a racist. Uh, he, he killed one of the greatest men in American history. But 
I want you, the reader, to decide how evil they are, the bad they've done, how great King and Kennedy and Lincoln are. And so I don't say in the book, Booth is evil or Booth is bad. I want you, the reader, to come to your own conclusion that that is true. So I want to give you the facts, put you in the position of Lincoln, to put you in Booth's position, in Ray's position, and I'm confident that young readers will, will have the judgment and discernment to know who the heroes of the books are and, and who the, the bad men are. I think it would be a mistake to start a book by saying, uh, you know, the evil John Wilkes Booth, you know, on page one or page two. I want you to see him and know him and judge him yourself. So that's, that's kind of the technique I use. Thank you. Yes. I was wondering, are you gonna write any more young adult books about American history? I am. Uh, I'm working on a book with Henry Louis Gates from Harvard, and we're writing a book on what I think is one of the greatest untold African-American history stories ever. And we're doing an adult book of that, and we're also doing a young adult book for my uh, publisher, Scholastic. And I'm, I'm working on a few other uh, young adult books also, but that's probably going to be the next one. I really enjoy doing them because I love going to the schools. I love getting the letters from, from the young readers. So I get a lot of personal satisfaction from doing that. So I, I want to keep writing uh, young adult books. Thank you. I love your books. Oh, thank you. Yes. Good morning. Um, I think uh, it's, it's possible with a lot of study to see some of the motivations of John Wilkes Booth and and Lee Harvey Oswald sort of understand mm -hmm. why they did these things. James Earl Ray, um, I'm curious of your opinion about motivation because uh, racism doesn't seem to have been what drove him around through his criminal career. Uh, I've heard rumors, I'm not sure how the historians have treated them, about there being a pot of money people used to gossip about in the South that if you killed King, there'd be some people to pay you off or something. What, what do you think drove James Earl Ray? Well, James Earl Ray is in many ways a mystery or a cipher. Uh, he himself loved the fact that people couldn't remember him. They couldn't remember that they had met him. He, he had that everyman look. We know this, James Earl Ray was a lifelong racist, uh, but that was common at that time in that place. Millions of his fellow Americans shared his racial views. He was never part of the Klan. He never participated in racial violence. He never seemed obsessed with Martin Luther King. And so when he escaped from prison, we know he didn't escape for the purpose of hunting Dr. King. And he always wanted to live, live in the shadows. We don't know what went on in his mind when King came to California. And then he, Ray drove across the country and murdered him three weeks later. Uh, I don't believe it was a conspiracy. There's no evidence that it was. Uh, he didn't seem to have personal hatred for Dr. King. There were rumors that a wealthy white man in the South had put a $50,000 bounty on King's head. But if that's true, how could Ray have ever collected that reward? Would he have just showed up at his door and said, hello, I'm the wanted man, where's my money? After studying Ray for a long time, I think Ray, in the end, wanted to be something or do something worthwhile. He thought it'd be a hero to racists if he killed King. He thought it'd be remembered. So I think Martin Luther King was the vehicle through which James Earl Ray could achieve a place in history. The frustrating thing is, although Ray lived for 30 years and he pled guilty initially, he tried to retract the plea, for 30 years he claimed he didn't do it. There are dozens and dozens of pieces of evidence that proved it was him. He claimed he wasn't even the trigger man. Not just the conspirators sent him, he, he claimed he didn't fire the rifle. Evidence proves that he did. So the great frustration is, although he lived for three decades, Ray never told us why he did it. He never even would admit that he did do it. So it's one of the great mysteries, but I think all, all the evidence indicates that Ray did it for personal significance or achievement to, to see that somehow he had made a mark in the world. That's uh, yeah, my best you. guess. Yes. Two-part question. First part, with your books on King and Kennedy, did you get any feedback from the families? Because yeah, obviously with Lincoln, that was a long, long time ago, but these are still families that are alive and in existence. And the King family particularly has watched over their father's legacy. So any feedback from them? No, I did not. Uh, the Kennedy family uh, prefers not to discuss the assassination. 
And in fact, they don't like to mark November 22nd, 1963. They prefer to celebrate John Kennedy's birthday. And so they're not really interested uh, in the assassination. I have talked to a number of John Kennedy's friends, and I know Clint Hill, the heroic Secret Service agent who leaped on the car to, to shield Jackie Kennedy. And these people have been very compliment, complimentary of the book and, and my, my take on, on John Kennedy. I have heard talk to Lyndon Johnson's family about uh, my books. And uh, I think LBJ is a great unsung hero of civil rights in America, and I'm a big fan of Lyndon Johnson. And uh, they've appreciated my, my take on LBJ. I've not heard from the, the King family. Uh, the King family, in large part, believes there was a massive US government conspiracy to murder their father. And there's a shocking photograph of one of Dr. King's sons visiting James Earl Ray in prison, reaching out his hand to shake uh, the hand of the man who, in fact, without a doubt, murdered his father. Uh, but I've not heard from them directly. Uh, it's unfortunate that they've had this contact with the man who killed their father, uh, but I've not heard from them. And then the second part, and you just alluded to that, did the King family, with their background, do they forgive? Well, one of King's sons said, we believe you did not kill our father. And so there was not really forgiveness because he said, we don't believe it. Uh, that I do not believe is true. James Earl Ray was the assassin of Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, I think that's proven without any doubt whatsoever. Uh, the conspiracy theories are interesting. They're a world unto themselves. And I do address the conspiracy theories in the books. Uh, we want to believe them because we believe that if someone like Martin Luther King can be struck down, John F. Kennedy, what hope do we have for order and planning in our lives? If, if great men of history can be struck down randomly, we want to believe there's a larger pattern behind our misfortunes, our terrible things in the world. It's so natural a human impulse to want to believe the, these conspiracy theories, but uh, they're most often not true. Great, thank you. Yes. Good morning. Um, I have a process question. So as a nonfiction writer, how do you take primary and secondary source, historical sources and weave those into your books? The thing I'm most interested in is the objects and documents and artifacts themselves. In this book, I include a lot of original documents and artifacts, like uh, morning bitten buttons that people would put on their clothes to remember Dr. King, posters, uh, music of the time, recordings. Uh, Dr. King's speeches, and I do recommend in my extensive notes refer you to Dr. King's speeches. You should listen to him when you read this book. It's, it, you're losing a lot if you don't listen to his words as you read the book. I try to find uh, rarely seen photographs, uh, very detailed maps, immersing myself in the sources, going to the places where history happened, holding in my hands the objects, holding in my hands the reward posters in my collection and then showing them to the reader. Uh, those are the most important sources to me. The original magazines, the newspapers, the, the sound recordings, the photographs, the artifacts. I really want to immerse myself back in that world and feel like I'm living back in that time. That's probably the, the, the key method that I use. Thank you. Excuse, can I ask one question? Yes. Like, why did the King children allowed to, why did Dexter, why was he allowed to go to the prison to talk to his killer in 1997, the year before he died? Why did they allow him to do that? Well, James Earl Ray was allowed to receive visitors in prison, and, and Dexter King uh, requested to visit James Earl Ray for the purpose of telling Ray uh, that he didn't believe he killed his father. So no one, no one could really prevent that. Uh, Ray was allowed to receive visitors. Dexter King wanted to see him. I think it's so unfortunate. Uh, the photo of Martin Luther King's son shaking hands with the man who killed his father is heartbreaking for me to see. Why is it heartbreaking for you to see that he would do that? Because Ray did murder his father. The King family is wrong about that, sad to say. James Lord Ray was the man who killed Martin Luther King. Right. And it was just sad to see one of King's sons shake the hand of the man who actually killed his father. I have a quite another, like why Go. didn't Kennedy's family want to mark the anniversary of his death? Why didn't they? The, the, they want the living JFK to be remembered. 
uh, the murder of President Kennedy was a searing experience. It was captured on film. It's one of the most horrific films in American history. It, it, it seared Jackie Kennedy, who witnessed it. And she preferred to never speak publicly about the murder of her husband again and after 1963. Do you think it had to do with Russia or Cuba why Kennedy was murdered? Do you think it did and was Oswald marrying a Russian? No, there's not time to get to that now, but if you look at the, my, my adult and my young adult JFK book, Lee Harvey Oswald was the man who murdered President Kennedy. Did, did it have to do with his, because he visited two communists who hated the US, and did they give him influence to, and convince him to, us, to get interested in doing it? Absolutely not. Why don't you think it had to do with Russia or Cuba? Well, all I can say is the evidence suggests it, but there's one more question, and we're running out of time. So can I take your question? Yes, please, and, and thank you so much. I think that authors really are seekers of truth, but I, I always wonder, is there a moment of doubt when you find your words to express what you saw, and maybe the words, what you researched, and maybe the words are not deep enough or strong enough? How do you get past, if it happens to you, how do you get past that moment of doubt in the process and art of expressing the truth you found? Well, uh, in other words, express it more clearly or yeah, fully? Okay, right. well, I think we all suffer from that problem. And I agree with what Stephen King said in his wonderful book on writing. King said, even the best of us, and I don't say I'm the best of us, King himself says he's not the best among us. King says, all writers experience the frustration of knowing that the words that appear on the page, no matter how many drafts we do, how many times we rewrite it, we often feel that the words we write don't fully express the emotions we feel. And, and I think it's just endemic to be a writer, where we think we can always do it better, be more precise, or express the feelings of us or others better. It's one of the frustrating things about writing books. You always ask yourself, could I have done that better? Well, thanks for the courage to be an author. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I've read in your Tracing Lincoln Taylor that when you were young that your grandmother gave you an engraving of the Derringer pistol. That's How did you get into the assassinations of um, great American heroes? Well, uh, with Lincoln, uh, there was my, I was born on Lincoln's birthday, and I studied Lincoln since I was a boy. I barely remember the Kennedy assassination, and I wanted to write about things that happened in my lifetime. I loved writing about Lincoln, but uh, we don't know anyone who knew Lincoln. We can't talk to someone who knew Lincoln. I could talk to people who were friends of John Kennedy. I could meet people who were friends of Martin Luther King. And I wanted to write about things that happened in my lifetime, where I could still talk to the people who lived through it. And I think we've run out of time, is that right? Uh, so thank you very much.